This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, hello, and a very warm welcome to and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve. My name is Damon. And behind me, going rather, in search of cheetah. We're going to be heading into some open plains to go in search of a mother cheetah and her two youngsters. And they haven't been seen for quite some time, and we're looking very forward to hopefully showing them to you a little bit later. For, for the time being, though, there's a And us. Hello again and welcome back to Ambient Pinda. Once again my name is Damon, behind the camera is Craig and just watching that beautiful sunrise now, the beautiful golden orb coming up out of the eastern horizon over the Indian Ocean and now kind of disappearing uh, into the clouds. And like I said we're very excited this morning, we're going to go in search of that mother cheetah and her two youngsters out in the open grasslands. But look at that. Some golden rays coming through the beautiful clouds there. And you might just be able to hear behind me off in the distance some hippos calling. They have no doubt just made their way back into the water after feeding out on the grasslands during the night. Lots of different birds calling. 
It's amazing how every morning now we can notice that the the sun is coming up earlier and earlier and going down later and later as we start to as the seasons here start to change. We start to head towards spring. Just a couple of weeks ago we were out on drive and we were already seeing or we were had been out on drive for, for a good half an hour or so before we actually got to see the sun coming up. And now it's it's <laughs> now it's rising before the before the show even starts. We're hoping that the higher it gets, it's gonna start to move into that little gap there. And we'll maybe catch another glimpse of it, but look at how much brighter that little band that little gap in the clouds is getting. Oh, look at that. And look at the rays of light also above the clouds. The sky is getting brighter by the second. It's almost a bit, of, a bit of a haze as well, off in the distance. Often at this time of year, it's what we do get to see. It's often a bit of dust hanging in the air. Oh, so pretty. Oh, and while we are enjoying the sunrise, you might be able to hear if I keep quiet, <laughs> there's a wildebeest that's just stood in front of us and it's busy grazing. So I'm going to keep quiet for a second and see if we can hear it chewing and then maybe also take in some of the sounds of the different birds that are calling around us. Just be able to make out that crunching of grass. And then there's a southern fiscal calling that chink me, chink me. Linma, are you saying lots of bird calls? Absolutely. First thing in the morning, many different bird species currently calling just to kind of announce to the world that they're still alive and well after the night, that they've made it through the night. Calling to their mates, calling to other birds to say that. They're still here, they're still occupying their little patch. There's a white browed scrub robin calling behind us, that repetitive whistling sound. And it looks like the sun has made it through that little gap. And it's now heading up into the denser band of clouds. So let's have a look at this, this wildebeest here in front of us, everybody. Just going to duck my head so that crate can film over the top of me. There he is. There's also a small group of impala off to the left of him. Look at how his coat looks a bit matted, almost like someone's kind of roughed it up the wrong way. And that's of course all of his, all of his hairs are standing on end, shame. Even though the sun is coming up a little bit earlier, it's still quite chilly here. And so both this wildebeest and now looking through my binoculars at those impala, they've all got their hair standing up on end trying to trap some, some warm air in their coat to keep warm. And I think myself and Craig from here are going to keep on moving. Like I said, we're going to go see if we can find those cheetah and hopefully when you come back to us, we'll have some fresh tracks or some fresh signs of them. I think this is a nicely subtly coloured sunrise here. 
There's very little orange or yellow in it. It's at least orange or red. It's almost entirely yellow, which of course is a very cheerful colour. It makes me very happy. My name is James Henry. Hello. Making his world premiere today on camera is Mark. Mark, show us your thumb. There is his thumb. That's the thumb of a man who's worked hard in his life. Let's go back to the sunrise. It's great to be with you here on a chilly morning in the low felt. I'd say it's probably about 14 degrees or so where I'm sitting, maybe a bit less actually. And we've had some lion tracks, but they've crossed out of the reserve for now. So we'll head off towards the east and see if we can't pick up some spots from Tundi the Leopardess and maybe, if we're really, really lucky, her son. Remember to send through your questions and comments to the four channels available to you. The hashtag Wild Earth on the Tweet Tweet. Otherwise the chat stream on Twitch or YouTube or... If you're under the age of 18, or very good at pretending you're under the age of 18, kids' questions at wildearth.tv. Questions, comments, insults, jokes, general banter, all will be gladly and gratefully received. Let's have a listen to the dawn. a few Franklins, doves, and lovely hornbills as well. Whoop whoops. It's alive this morning, it really is. Robin also going. Right, well, before the day gets too old, let us continue towards the east. Hopefully some animals will shortly make themselves known to us, or we to them. because the wind has stopped blowing which means that I think we'll probably have a warm day it also means I think the animals will be more forthcoming than they were yesterday and I don't know if you were with us on drive yesterday evening but it was extremely special we got very lucky with our wild dog pack we met their pups again and they killed right in front of us it was a magnificent evening for all concerned except the poor little Stirnbock who unfortunately met his end but mostly very fast. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's chilly here and we are bumbling south. Who are we? My name is Lauren and I have Theo on camera. And just to go on what James said, <laughs> I think the steam bog was one of one half of the monogamous pairing that I have been following and they have a youngster. <laughs> so I'm absolutely devastated. I still don't know if it was a male or a female that the wild dogs caught, but I'm very sad. The most habituated, relaxed steenbok on the entire reserve. <sighs> anyway, wild dogs were fantastic. I got them in the morning with BK and then James and Theo got them in the afternoon. So we've all seen this pack. 
It's a pack that don't normally come into Juma. They don't normally really come into this entire area and we really hope they might settle here. The pups are around 10 weeks, still not got a total number. Someone said 10 yesterday, someone said 12. There was 13 and a Talamati lioness got one of them. So there really should be 12. If there's any less than 12, then something else has happened that nobody knows about. So they're roughly around 10 weeks and they're big. I don't really think the Pungwe pack are denning anymore. They're too big for a den. They're going to be mobile with the pack. They'll also be stashed away just like lions and leopards do, but they're going to be a lot more mobile. But wouldn't it be nice if they just start, started to use Juma? A little bit more. We got incredibly lucky yesterday and they took down an adult female kudu. It was called in as an impala but it was a kudu and I actually watched the footage of the kill. Two dogs, the alpha male and the alpha, oh lion tracks, alpha male and alpha female taking down a kudu together. That's incredible. So I'm gonna stop and investigate these tracks. Good morning and welcome to Andion Gala. We're looking at a beautiful sunrise over the Timbavati riverbed this morning. We're right in the middle of the riverbed. I'm Yapi and behind the camera we have Owen. And this morning we've started out driving the riverbed. We found tracks coming right from the camp with, uh, of a lioness with her two cubs. And we suspect that she's went to go fetch them from wherever she's kept them. And she's moving towards where the rest of the pride is. And we will probably move into the area or the direction that the tracks are heading. See if we might find any signs of the rest of the pride. We also have tracks of a young female leopard moving around. And we can hear baboons alarming in the back or in the distance. Now... There is a chance that they might be seeing the leopard at this point. And we're hoping that if we spend a bit of time in this area, we might be able to find something. Now where we are, there's lots of diggings in the riverbed. Lots of, it looks like fresh diggings, maybe from yesterday with tracks of elephants. It looks like a large herd of elephants have come through here. And yesterday was fairly hot in the middle of the day, so I think the elephants came and they were trying to get some water. Now, often these holes get utilized by animals, especially animals that don't have a lot of, or don't have to drink a lot of water, like the leopard, for instance. Ooh, we have two great diker coming down on a game trail off to our left. The other one just ran off, unfortunately. Very, very difficult to get those little antelopes on the camera. I can see the one still standing there. As soon as it moved into the thick bush, it slowed down. You can see it's just sneakily moving along the edge of the riverbank. And they came down. It looked like they came down quite quickly. Now, it's more than likely a male and a female. You don't often see these two together, usually you'll find them one by one. Unless it's a mother and a young one, or in this case, judging from the size of both of them, it might be... a pair that was mating, or that met up in this area. Maybe this male, you can see it's got two little horns at the top, so this is a male. And I think he was probably moving closer to the female for the last couple of days. Now, like this the diker, I think it was probably coming down here to come and have a look to see if there might be any little bit of water, like a small puddle, left at the bottom of these diggings that the elephants made. see it disappear off. Now, 
It sounds like the baboons have stopped calling now. I'm not sure. Maybe it was just big male calling to get the troop mobilizing and start moving for the morning. But what an unbelievable view we have. The good things about these stops in the mornings is you often get lucky with this. You might hear nearby sounds of predators. The lions might be calling. Daniela, it is certainly a beautiful sunrise. Very mysterious. I guess these old rivers in the low felt, or this larger area, is quite mysterious. You get that sense if you are lucky, to, lucky enough to move within one, like we are here on Ngala. And this particular spot is probably where it must be looks like from the amount of elephant dung in the riverbed it looks like there's old ones newer ones from like a couple of days ago and then some of them that's been here a long time see the reeds all around them have all been fed off and cropped down to more or less the same level so i think in this particular patch the water level is quite high underneath the sand so the sand itself is a little bit lower maybe than some of the other parts in the riverbed it's right within a bend mm. can you hear some lions calling in the distance Doesn't sound too far away. And I think we are going to start heading into that direction. And hopefully, while those lions are calling, they'll give us a clear indication of where they're going, whether they're coming close towards where we're going, or whether they're moving away. I'm not entirely sure. I suspect it's one of the males calling. We haven't seen the males in the last two days, and I'm pretty sure that it was about time that they would try and meet up with the rest of the pride. Now, when we left the rest of the pride last night, it looks like they were moving to hunt. And the area where those calls are coming from is the area that we suspect that they might have moved towards. Lots of general game that spend their night there like the wildebeest, herds of zebra, and lots of impala in that particular part. There's even giraffe. And when that male is calling like that, it means that he must have either met up with a pride trying to call to his brother. It sounded like only one male calling, one can hear when it's more than one calling and sometimes the animals will respond to each other over large distances. So myself and Owen's going to continue into that area and see if we might have a bit of luck this morning. We've got a hyena. Just watching, I don't know who it is yet. Damaged ears, very damaged ears on both sides. And it's just fascinating to watch the way they walk. I'll get up a little bit ahead and Theo can zoom in. There you go. And to maintain our distance, of course. I just find them so fascinating. They could literally navigate blind. I think if you blindfolded a hyena, this is hypothetical, of course we would never do this. I really believe that it would just almost behave the same. 
is literally following its nose here. There's no visual cues, there's no real trajectory, just the nostrils. I find it so fascinating. There's no obstacle too great, they're just gonna follow their nose. And that's why hyenas end up in so much trouble because, well, they end up getting into situations and following their nose. Now, I'm gonna try and get closer because I want an ID. If any of you can work with that ID, send it in, hashtag Wild Earth and let me know. I unfortunately can. I need to see the face and the side. But we're not too far from the den, which is interesting. The den's already been checked by others and it's not active. So I just want to give it a little bit of a break before I go and check. We don't want too many vehicles going to that den. But it may, as the sun comes up and it warms up a little bit, that's normally when the little cubbies come out. It's too cold for them early in the morning. So they stay in their warm, lovely little mound. <laughs> I wonder where it's going. Now we get asked a lot, do hyenas follow the predators? And yes, oh, we're galloping, we're galloping off. We saw June with the wild dogs yesterday and we weren't there at the time of the kill but the hyena was on the scene immediately and I believe probably following the scent of the dogs knowing that they're going to kill and knowing at any moment you can come in and steal that. That's very smart. I'm going to follow this hyena and hopefully it takes me to the den. We have got some nice pictures here of a kudu. This particular kudu is, well, just staring at us. Wondering what we want. Unaware that we only want to observe what she's doing. Unfortunately, everything is trying to stand behind as many sticks as possible this morning. We're on the eastern boundary. No tracks yet. No sign of anything much except these pretty kudu. Oh, here we go, one sort of coming out a bit into the open. Colors are really nice there. Sort of browns and tans and beiges of the kudu with the greens and golds. I like the color palette at this time of the year, I must say. I think it might be my favorite color palette. The world right, the kudu now disappeared. We'll continue towards the south. Update on those wild dogs from yesterday is that they seem to have headed onto a reserve to the west of us called Arethusa. We might be able to head round towards the west a bit later, but we'll see. Just want to investigate this area first. Can't be everywhere at once, it's a bit of a problem really. are watching the golden orb of the sun slowly ascending into this clear sky here at Pridelands and what a gorgeous morning it's promising to be nice and still nice and cold and can't wait to see what it provides hi I'm Mike behind the camera we've now got Seb he's back um, and uh, we're here at Eco Trainings Pridelands Conservancy just sitting at Leopard Dam hoping to hear any sounds of that single lioness 
that we uh, that we saw yesterday uh, afternoon on foot, Ghiat and I, when we went to track her, uh, but no sign of her yet this morning. So now we just stopped here at this very nice and quiet and still leopard dam, hoping to hear any sounds that might lead us towards something exciting this morning. Look how still that is. I, you, you know, if you if you imagine it, can't you can't really tell which is the sky and which is the reflection. Apart from that, the, if it was upside down, the clouds would be this brown dirt. That's pretty cool. It's super still. So on these cold, still mornings, sound will travel incredibly far. If we hear any lions calling, we might hear them up to eight kilometers away, which is incredible. It's very nice and quiet. Good crested barbets calling. Lots of birds. Oh, and there's a dike coming down to the water, but it's just to the left there, just behind the bushes. That's so nice there. So peaceful. I wonder if Lagatha came, the lioness. We suspect it was Lagatha. Pretty sure it was Lagatha, the lioness. I wonder if she came down to drink at the water hole last night. Last time we found her at the water hole, it was the ripples of the water that actually gave her away. There goes the diker, just to the left of those, those trees. Yeah, just, just left of those, but I mean, I don't think we'll see her now. She's moving off. It was a, a female diker with no, no horns. Melanie, totally agree with you. Beautiful morning, beautiful day. There's not a day in Africa that isn't beautiful, though, to be fair. Even when it's windy, even when it's cold, you just have to look outside and imagine where you are, and you know, it's absolutely spectacular. Where are you right now, Melanie? I wonder, are you also in Africa somewhere? Let us know. I'm just enjoying the quiet sounds. You can see there's a few ripples in the water there. Just gentle ripples. There's a movement of air. I wouldn't even call it wind or even a breeze. It's just literally a movement. There's a few little insects and things in the water. Dibble dabbling. I'm sure even the terrapins right now will be going out somewhere on a sunny bank trying to warm up because it's very, very cold. They'll want to get warm as quick as possible. Aramarked babblers calling. Lots of different Franklins. Hmm. Yeah, can't wait to see what this morning brings. That's lucky. What was that? Did I hear something from the final control? Yes. Apparently we're live. I thought we were live. Were we not live to start with? I think maybe I was talking and we weren't live. I, <laughs> I think I may have been presenting to no one in particular while we drove along the road. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I don't know how much of this this trunk you got. Um, so, yeah, like I, I, I don't know when we went off air. This, <laughs> I climbed a marula tree yesterday, not sure if you heard that, and I pontificated about how the bark comes off in strips and how it's a really clever way of the tree avoiding being devoured by elephants. And I was just saying then that an elephant has made a lot of effort to take that much bark off this marula tree. I think it probably would have taken a few hours because the bark is quite nicely designed so that it's almost not impossible, but it's really difficult for an elephant to ring bark a marula tree. I realize I had my radio turned down. So I suspect between the kudu and this tree you've been somewhere else, but I've been talking to you basically continuously the whole time. Good. Well, 
That's pleasant to see. Lovely morning. And it's so lovely because it's so still. That wind has gone away. The eastern horizon is still yellow. The world's most cheerful colour. Birds are calling. The leopards, unfortunately, are not walking around on the road in front of us, ah, but we'll make do. All right, let's continue. Turn my radio up so that I can hear what's going on in the final control. And so off to the south. I'm not sure. Oh, James off to the south. Well, I've came back north because I've just been follow following this hyena very slowly behind. Just fascinated by where it's going. It didn't turn into the den. I don't know who it is. And I just wonder where it's going to lead us. The Impalas had a little bit of a fright earlier. But once the hyena moved off, once the threat moves off, the hyenas, not the hyenas, the Impalas will stop alarm calling. It's over. The threat's over. I just wonder where this hyena's going. I just want to give it enough space. And oh, there's a giraffe. We're going to get a two shot of a hyena walking towards a giraffe. Look at that. The giraffe probably will stare it down. They're the lighthouses of the bush. They can see everything before most other animals. Look at that. Hyena shows absolutely no, not a care in the world that there's a huge giraffe in front of them. Giraffe does not look impressed. This is quite literally a stare down. <laughs> Lauren coming. <sighs> James is calling me, but I want to quickly see if we can follow this hyena and I will get back to him. Wow! The giraffe's not moved the muscle, it's now watching us. I think it's one of the big bulls that have been around least recently. But I don't want to zoom past it and give it a fright, so we're just going to watch this giraffe for a while. Now, Technically speaking, the force behind a giraffe is incredible. And they could really, really kick an animal like a hyena and do severe da damage, if not kill it. I mean, the males come in at anywhere between 1,000 to 1,400 kilograms. And the females are less, they're normally around 700 to 900. But still, that is a huge body mass. And one kick from a giraffe's leg could absolutely kill an animal like a hyena. <laughs> He's watching us. But I think here, the giraffe was very aware that that hyena was not an immediate threat. You can actually find predators sometimes by watching the behavior of a giraffe. They stare them down Unless it's a pride of lions or a couple of lions, the giraffes will run. And somehow, prides of lions can successfully take down a giraffe, even a bull. The sad thing for a giraffe is because they're so uniquely balanced, they have that camel-like walk. Once they topple, 
if a pride of lions were to chase and make the giraffe topple, it's very unlikely that that giraffe will be able to get up quick enough to escape the lions and it would be game over. <laughs> I see you, mister. I don't want to go any further, but we have lost our hyena, I'm afraid. I wonder if it's heading to the pan and have a little drink. still watching us. I'm not entirely sure what we are doing here. Imagine having that vantage point over the land. Isn't it beautiful? So everyone, don't forget to talk to us, send in your questions and your comments or your jokes, whatever you wish. Hashtag Wilds Earth on Twitter or at FC on the YouTube chat stream and Twitch. But kids, if you're watching, no matter where in the world you are, you can also send in your incredible questions, but you email them to us. Let us know where you're from and your age. And the email address is kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. Now exactly what this giraffe is doing right now sort of shows that the long necks didn't just evolve for food. Because regularly you'll find giraffes browsing on low vegetation, small vegetation. They don't always reach up for the high foliage. They go for whatever is delicious. And they're regularly bending down. Which I think emphasizes that theory that giraffes evolved the long neck for food. Okay, we're gonna sit tight and watch this beautiful male have his breakfast. From a giraffe looking forward to having its breakfast to some zebra that are no doubt looking for theirs. Myself and Craig are entering these open grassy plains now, like we said, we're going in search of a cheetah with her youngsters. And in the meantime, we found this small group of zebra. It looks like a small harem. Look at that zebra on the far right, now obscured a little bit by the bushes. But look at how much thicker, can you see how much thicker its neck is than the other ones? And it's much more stocky. And that is this harem's stallion, the, the, the male that leads this harem. And then the other three will all be his females. And it looks like they've been resting down in the bottom of this valley. And they're now starting to make their way up the slopes to go in search of some food. There he goes. Nose to the ground, sniffing as he goes. His mates don't seem to be too, too keen to follow. Oh no, there they go. All walking in single file. Going behind this big bush here. But looking around, there's quite a few little groups of zebra, of zebra dotted around in this little valley. So there's obviously some good food resources here. Here they come. Stopping to look at us. I 
Minamu, you're asking how strong a zebra's kick is. Minamu, it's very, very, very strong. And look at how big, so I'm gonna ask Craig just to zoom in onto one of the zebra's butts as they walk past. I know that sounds quite weird. But just to show you, Minamu, how big that muscle mass is around the base of the leg. So, and then look at how thin the leg gets from, from that big kind of butt, if you will. And so that big muscle channels a lot of power into quite a narrow little area, which gives the zebra a lot of power when it runs and when it kicks. And Minamu, that kick can break a lion's jaw. In fact, recently we watched some zebras um, kind of fighting over a, a little pool of water um, to drink. And there was one zebra that was getting a little bit, kind of a little bit antsy, having all the other zebras so close to it. And it was trying to keep the other zebras away and it started to kick back at them. And this one poor zebra wasn't fast enough to move and it got kicked in the face once and it was dazed by the first kick and it got kicked again and again and it just couldn't move out of the way and eventually it kind of collapsed on the ground its jaw looked a little bit dislocated and there was blood coming out it was quite horrible to watch but now as these zebra move off um, myself and Craig are going to carry on looking for those cheetah and we'll actually be using animals like these zebra because if one of these zebra does spot a cheetah they'll start to stare at it and then we'll go and investigate what they're looking at so hopefully we can have some luck with that. Hi everyone, so what we found here yesterday when Claire and I were busy uh, following up on this lion's track, we actually came across some soapstone uh, artifacts in bowls. And I don't know how old they are, but as you can see, they're here lying in the grass. And uh, it's very interesting. Soapstone is a very I soft think stone. Jo, jo. Yeah, no, Joe, no, Joe, Mike. Yeah, I think that's strange. Right Our audio seems to be cutting out. Sorry about that. So, now I can show you <laughs> that we have a soapstone bowl. Okay, so you didn't hear that before. But I was saying, Kat and I yesterday had some, uh, some success finding the lioness, but we also found some soap. Uh, and this bowl here, I don't know how old it is, but it must have been used by some indigenous people. But hopefully, let me see how cool and smooth this stone is. Uh. And Adam and Thomas has managed to find the pride not far from where we were. We came upon this scene, fast asleep, not a worry in the world, not even that other lion we heard calling earlier. We heard that lion calling just now and it doesn't seem to be one of these guys. That male as well as his brother is here this morning. If you have a look at them, see there's his brother. Can you just see a little bit of his mohawk at the top? How amazing is that? It looks like it's part of that grass pole in front of it. Of a unsuspecting creature like a wildebeest in this area. Had to stroll past here, you would never know that there's a lion there. They all look fast asleep. You see, not even ears twitching. Very slow, shallow breathing. I believe I can hear one snoring. Hmm. Definitely. And the belly is bulging a little bit. I'm not sure what. And I think some poor, unsuspecting creature definitely fell victim. And also look by the way that male lion is cold up. It looks like he's a little bit cold as well. It is a little bit cooler than usual over the last week or so. We haven't had such cool mornings as this morning.
then no, they are very well camouflaged. Like they fit in perfectly in the environment, especially this time of the year, with this sunlight falling on the grass, the parts of the grass, that, all the grass blades that light up, except for that white one off to the back of the male, the rest of them are blending in perfectly at this point. As the grass dry out, especially after good rains, we still have a lot of long grass in this part of Ngala. These lions pretty much have all the advantage in their coat. It's perfectly blends in. This male is snoring. He's fast asleep at the moment. He didn't even lift his head when that other lion called from somewhere east of us. Definitely not a part of this pride. Now it's interesting when you look at them now like this and you hear them snore. It's all cuddled up and sleeping without it, not a worry in the world. You wonder to yourself, like, how can such animals be such such amazing top predators? You can see some scars on his face. You can see a nick or two out of the ears. And it's interesting to think that for this male to be able to sleep like this, he had to face quite a lot of challenges in his life. Luckily for him, he had his brother with him. But to get to this point, besides surviving its first year, then things go a little bit better, maybe for a year or two, until such time that they break away from the pride. And then the real challenge starts all the way up until a number of years later he reaches the point where he's able to have the confidence as well as the strength to take over an area that he considers his own territory like these two have and they've done pretty well they're reading quite a or they they're reaching quite a mature age at this point but it certainly has been quite the journey to get here, and they're still quite strong. They're doing very, very well. They've got a very large area that they reign over, and they constantly patrol this area, which means that they often spend large amounts of time, like up, often up to a week or more away from the rest of the pride. You can see all of the lines look like they're spread out right in a little patch of sun. Also trying to warm up after the cool morning. But other than that, they look quite content. Now somewhere we did see the lioness with the two small cubs who we had tracks of earlier. We did see the tracks leading into this area as we arrived here and I'm pretty sure that they're around but at the moment we don't have any view of them and we're not sure exactly where they are. Because of that perfect camouflage it's quite tricky even for us to see exactly where they all are. We know that there must be around, there must be 18 of these lines around at the moment. And all of them are spread out. So while they take a little nap, myself and Owen will sit here for a while longer to see if anything might change. Good morning, good morning, good morning from Sala Kalahari with David and myself. Um, 
it's a it's a little bit breezy out here this morning. Not bad. It's actually a beautiful morning, but I'm I don't know what to do at the moment because I'm getting really worried. Uh, we are with our shell ducks again. We're actually going to go do meerkats this morning because Rebecca did find them. They are there, so we'll just wait for the sun to come up a little bit warmer. And we'll head over there. But I'm with the shell ducks here, and David and I we can both only count five chicks or ducklings so i am oh my word and we had seven yesterday we had seven yesterday afternoon and now there's only five this is really not the way i want to start the day and i do know it is nature i you know i get that i mean you know i've been in it long enough to understand but oh my word oh. oh well okay well let's maybe they tucked him behind that that water crib over there could be could be and i just can't see from this angle and i but maybe let me walk there a little bit and just see anyway it's good having you with us regardless of how many shell ducks there are but i will still be very bleak if there are another two missing since yesterday. Jeez, I'm gonna be... Anyway, let's hope. Williams asked a wonderful question there. The question is, is there enough food for these ducklings to survive? Absolutely. There is plenty, plenty, plenty of food in this dam. Um, they just literally filtering, filtering little water organisms out there, um, both plant and animal. Um, so they're getting, yeah, the, the food here is not a problem at all. In fact, these shell ducks are so well adapted for water bodies in arid areas. And typically, your water bodies in arid areas are very, very, very sparse um, in terms of emer what we call emergent vegetation. In other words, like... Uh, plants that you can actually see like sticking out but inside this water if you had to take a, a dollop of this water a scoop of it and look at it under a, a microscope even a magnifying glass you'll actually just see that it is just crawling with all sorts of little critters so you now there's there's plenty of food for them in here and the, the nesting is so well timed um because they okay we pump these dams but it's it's such a small volume of water it'll just be a little puddle um, so they normally very, very dependent on what we call ephemeral water bodies, and, and an ephemeral water body is a body that a water that doesn't last a long time. It, it's normally there, um, like when a pan floods, when you get rains, and it'll disappear. So they really need a time there breeding cycles. They've got to synchronize their breeding cycles with the onset of the rains. Um, and so although we haven't had rains, this is still um, remaining from last year, um, but going into this, into this season now. And this, this is going to be a, literally a puddle in two months' time. But by then, these little ones are going to have been, uh, will have fledged already and moved off. So, yeah, they don't need lots of uh, um, like obvious plant life that we can see. You know, they, they can filter out plenty of little like, invertebrates in the water along with algae and that kind of stuff. So... Oh man, still five, eh, David? Yeah. Welcome back to Ambion Pinde, everyone. We've managed to find a bird that I think might be a new bird species for many of you, those of you who are keeping a list. It's a juvenile African cuckoo hawk. Oh, there it goes. They are quite busy birds, so it's often it's difficult to get them to sit still for long enough to actually film them. But just that glimpse on camera was worth it. And I hope that some of you were able to get some screenshots. I'll just show you in the bird book what it looks like. Here it is here. So this is the adult. And look at that beautiful grey head with that orange barring across the chest. Looks very similar to, the, to many of the cuckoo species that migrate here into southern Africa, like the common cuckoo. Um, the African cuckoo, and even the red-chested cuckoo. Like I said, that grey back. Um, this was the juvenile, that, though, that we saw. So the brown back with little white blotches, and then all those kind of dark brown streaks um, across the chest there. But super exciting. I hope that, like I said, if any of you are keeping a bird list, and if that's a new one for you, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to know what number that is. And 
especially, I mean, if it is a new Bertie species for you, super special to have found you a new raptor species. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, that cuckoo hawk has now flown off, gone in search of insects and different things to hunt. And so myself and Craig are going to carry on down into the grassland, um, still in search of that cheetah. That's very special, that cuckoo hawk. I saw a cuckoo hawk at Pinder once when I was training, and I had no idea how special it was. Now, we've got a lovely sighting there of an African harrier hawk. And it's doing some fossicking around on that tree. I would love to get closer, but I think it'll fly off, and it's just in such a beautifully exposed position. It always amazes me how they're able to just float like that from branch to branch. It looks like it should be much more effort. And then there's a bearded woodpecker above us making that lovely territorial tapping. There's the woodpecker. If you look up top there, Mark, top of this dead tree in front of us. Yeah, keep going. Up and center frame. Zoom in. You got him. Yeah, that's him. You got him. Now let's see if he'll do his tapping for us. Give him a second because I'd love to actually see his head doing that. You can see his tail being used as a brace and hopefully we will see the function or the impressiveness of the brace shortly. Come on, do your thing, bearded woodpecker. Neva, I think you'll find that the same goes for just about anything out here. Everything is pretty determined. They have to be, because if they aren't, you know, the, the last, the least determined animals out here tend to be the deadest animals out here. There we go. That was cool. And then our harrier hawk is back over there, Mark. The dead tree straight in front of us. He's landed. There we go. It's amazing that such a big bird can be so unbelievably agile in a tree because it's, I mean, it's got long legs, it's got feathers and tail and wings all over the place. And yet still, it manages to be so unbelievably good.
Oh, he's landed right there. <laughs> Let's stay where we are. Surely can't be long before Drongo comes across him or takes offence and starts to bomb him. Just in case some of you are seeing this bird for the first time, he's looking for anything that he can get underneath the bark and in the little holes in all these trees. I don't understand your question, I'm afraid, Moonbeam. Does a raptor pick out a feather in order to maintain balance? Um, I'm afraid I don't know. You mean if it loses one, does it pull out another one? If it's got too many feathers on one side, will it take out feathers on the other side to maintain balance while it's flying? Well, I mean, that happens when they molt. But they'll, you know, I don't think that's a, a conscious thing. <clears throat> I suppose if one feather got damaged on one side and it found itself unbalanced, I wonder if it would know or understand to remove one on the other side in order to maintain balance. I'm not sure. I suspect it may well compensate in other ways. Yvette, you say it's got a beautiful wingspan, it does. And what's interesting also is the, uh, the surface area of the wing is high, and that allows it to do these kind of floaty flights. So I don't think it's a particularly maneuverable bird once it's flying. It's not a, like a goshawk which can you know, change direction at a moment's notice. I think it's probably not quite as good as that. But when it's floating about in the branches, it's unbelievable. It's so effortless it looks. I don't suppose it is, but it certainly looks effortless.
that's what the bird will keep on doing. Beautiful, slightly, um, what should we say, it's beautiful death, I guess, flying around like that. Not very nice if you happen to be a bird. These rhinos that we've managed to find, everybody. Three white rhinos, all busy grazing. Spread out. And if you have a look at the left hand one, everyone, see it's next to quite a big, or well, no, it's not very big at all, it's quite small, um, quite next to a, a small tree. And look on the left hand side of the tree, there's a little bird there, a little fork tailed drongo. And as these rhinos have been moving around, as the shame, <laughs> Craig can't get the camera a little any further for now, but we'll we'll make do. As these rhinos have been moving around, they've been obviously grazing as they go and flushing little insects out of the grass. And it's been amazing to watch that little drongo swoop down and catch those little insects as they get disturbed by the rhinos. Also, just looking at the one on the left, look at how it's almost got a two-tone color to its body. Can you see that, everyone? There's like a like a light gray in its front end, and then its rump. Look at how dark its rump is. And looking through my binoculars, it looks like it's been in some mud. And there's a water hole not far from here, so perhaps a little bit earlier this morning, these rhinos were, were in the mud. Having a bit of a roll around, or maybe even at the end of yesterday. The sun was pretty intense. Quite a warm day. Perfect weather for rhinos to go and roll around in the mud. Yeah, looking at the mud again now from this angle, it does look like it has dried a bit. So probably from late yesterday. Quite a comical, quite a comical scene. Look at this enormous grey body moving through the grass. You can't see its face. You can just see its little ears sticking up above the grass. Veronica, you're asking about the difference between a black and a white rhino. And Veronica, I'm going to get my animal book out to show you the difference. I think that will be the best way to illustrate that. If you'll just give me one second. Always helps to have a book just to point out some of the differences. So here we go. Oh look, well now that rhino's looking at us. Oh there's a little calf there! Oh, sorry Veronica, we're going to come to the difference now, but there's a very small calf just to the left of that rhino on the far right. I don't know if you can see it, it's so small. Just see some tiny little ears protruding above the grass. Oh my word, we thought it was just these three, these three adult rhinos, but there's, it turns out there's a little calf there. So just see those tiny, we were talking about the ears and how, <laughs> how comical it is to see those ears sticking up above the grass and swiveling around. Oh, we've certainly been very lucky with rhino calves in the last, in the last little while. I know you had a fantastic sighting of a little rhino calf with Deervolt a little while ago. Looks like it's just investigating those other two rhinos, but sticking close to its mother. But I think now while this rhino cow, the mother, has got her head above the grass, or above the grass, and we can see her relatively well. Veronica, let's back come back to your question. So have a look at this this white rhino. Look at how look at her face. You might just be able to make out in between her ears quite a prominent hump. And that's a big muscle mass, um, kind of, 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 of her neck. And because these rhinos feed on grass, and they therefore have their heads low to the ground very often, that's kind of where their neck kind of reaches like a neutral resting position, their head down to 
to the ground. So if they lift their head up to look around, it causes the muscle to kind of bunch up on the back of the neck. Um, and that doesn't happen with a black rhino because when a black rhino walks around, it holds its head out in front of it because it feeds on, on, on twigs and bushes and leaves. Um, and so it doesn't have that big bump on the back of its neck. And I think for the rest of the differences, Veronica, I'm going to show you in the book quickly. So Craig, if you wouldn't mind just coming over to, to here. Veronica, here, have a look at this. these two rhinos here. These are white rhinos. Look at how square those mouths are for feeding on grass to help them to crop up the grass. And there's those bumps that I spoke about. They've both lifted, see how they've both lifted their heads. And so when that happens, the muscle kind of bunches up at the back. Um, there's what I was talking about earlier, how they walk with their head quite close to the ground. And then when that happens, kind of that muscle, that hump smoothens out a little bit. They are also quite a bit bigger than black rhinos. Look at the size comparison here compared to a human being. Um, and they've also got uh, quite a shallow kind of hump or a shallow saddle, if you will, in, the, in their back. So here's a picture of a small calf. And then you might just be able to see a very shallow saddle in the back there. By comparison, the black rhino, so see how it walks? Look at that picture down there. It walks with its head out in front of it, as opposed to close to the ground. It's got a, a pointy lip. It's difficult to see with this picture, but it's got a pointy lip, a little prehensile lip, that it uses almost like a miniature elephant's trunk to gather up bushes and leaves um, to feed itself. And then it's got a very deep saddle on its back quite a deep saddle and yeah a little bit smaller as well than than the white rhino but also some behavioral different differences too like white rhino often because they feed on grass they often tend to frequent more open areas black rhino tend to stick to to more dense areas in the thickets where their food is white rhino are often seen to be a bit more gregarious moving around in slightly larger groups black rhino more often than not either solitary or maybe a mother with a calf or maybe especially around water uh, they'll often gather around water or around good resources to feed or to drink. Um, yeah, those are some of the differences. Also, black rhino can often be a little bit more, like here we're watching these rhinos and they're pretty relaxed around us. They haven't even looked at us since we've been here. Black rhino often, because of their habit of, of living in denser bush, they can often be a bit more nervous and kind of jumpy around, around vehicles. But a super special sighting. We're going to let these rhinos continue on with their feeding for the morning. And myself and Craig are going to go see if we can find any fresh signs of those cheetah we're looking for. Wild Earth relies on support from viewers like you to carry on broadcasting our daily live shows. A small donation goes a long way in helping us on our mission to connect the world with nature. Please visit our support page to see how you can help and become part of the Wild Earth family. So we've managed to find a little pearl spotted owlet enjoying the morning sun just like us, sitting nice and still on a branch. There's a few other birds around, some hornbills and other things. If this pearl spotted owlet moves around too much, it will get spotted by them and get chased off. Look at those dark patches behind its head. Those are false eyes. Oh, look at that, it's showing us. That helps it to not be ambushed by anything because the predator will think that it is looking at it, even if it's behind. Oh, a cute little call. Careful, don't call too loudly. That also attracts uh, the other birds that will mob it and chase it away. In our camp a few days ago, a pearl-spotted owlet actually caught and ate uh, a dark-capped bulbul, which is a bird about the same size as this owlet. Tiny bit smaller, maybe, but not much. That's pretty interesting. So yeah, when this bird gets spotted, it will, uh, spotted, pearl spotted. When this bird gets spotted, it will uh, get chased away by all the other birds around here. But a cute little bird. Not very big eyes compared to a lot of the other owls. Huh. Lundeke in the FC says, funny. I'm doing good. I'm practicing my dad jokes. Gert's not with me now, so I, he, he gives me my material. But Seb's also very funny. But this, uh... This owl doesn't seem to have enjoyed the joke. It's a little round puffball. So this owl is very small. Probably just a little bit larger than a fist-sized bird. So really, really tiny, but very strong. Elizabeth, I agree. It is a nice little fluffy owl. 
it's fluffed up, especially now because it's it's a cold breeze, but the, the, the sunlight is warm. So what it does is it puffs its, its feathers out to try and trap warm air against its skin, and then it'll be nice and warm for the morning. It'll go and rest somewhere in these big tall trees around here and stay very still for the day where it can sleep and rest. And then the early part of the afternoon, or I should rather say the early part of the evening, it will start being active again, catching any insects that are moving about, rodents, small birds, and some fairly decent sized birds. I think that the owlet could probably catch something up to about the size of an emerald spotted wood dove, which is a little bit smaller than this owlet, or maybe about the same size. Look at those look at those dark eye patches on the back of its head. I think that's amazing. It literally looks like, whichever way it looks, there's eyes watching you. It's a really good defensive technique. I think it's called a startle display, but I could be wrong. It could also be a distraction display. But nonetheless, this bird is employing many different techniques, from disruptive coloration, camouflage, to these distraction and startle displays. Amazing little predator. Owls are so amazing, you know, I think people love owls, a lot of people love owls, a lot of people that I know really like them because of the fact they're considered to be so wise. But actually in Southern Africa, in many um, African cultures, they're considered to be an, a bad omen. Not so much these small owls, but the big owls, when they get seen or heard, um, often it's considered a bad omen, something bad is going to happen. Hopefully this one is not signaling any bad omens for us this morning. Hopefully this one is sending us some good vibes. Very alert. It's looking all around every now and again there. I can hear things scratching around in the undergrowth. So I wonder if uh, perhaps it might be looking for one last minute opportunity to hunt and catch something small for breakfast. Or is it dinner for an owlet? Hello. <laughs> Hi there. Maya owls eat a variety of different things. This particular small owl will eat rodents and small birds. Oh, it's going to fly off. Goodbye. It was saying goodbye to us, eh? Goodbye, yeah. goodbye, goodbye, and then it flew off. So Maya, a lot of different things. From from small birds and rodents, mostly rodents, something, things that are on the ground, but I've even seen large eagle owls catch sleeping birds of prey, other eagles, because an eagle owl is a huge bird, over 60 centimeters tall, so they can catch a variety of birds as well. But yeah, not, not fussy about what they eat. So after my depressing moment this morning with those shell ducks, and I'm really bleak about it, I, and I know you shouldn't get attached to these things, but you, it, it's kind of one of those human fallibilities that you do end up in that trap. But anyway, so I thought I'd pop up to the Cape Turtle Dove Nest and see what's going on here. And <laughs> I'm not having a huge amount of success because I think, uh, David, we said there were three nestlings on there. Well, there's one now, so 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 we're on a 33 and a third percent success rate now. Anyway, that's uh, you know I don't know why I get surprised by this every single time or bleak about it because it's just absolutely part of nature and this the the very act of predation is one of the most important and key drivers for ecosystem health across the board. And you know the temptation is always there to find something that's like sick or injured, abandoned doesn't happen unless the parents get eaten. I promise you, and wild animals do not abandon youngsters. But like the temptations that you find, saying, oh, shame, you know, you want to raise it. But you're actually not doing the population a whole pile of justice when you do that kind of stuff. You know, you, you've got to let nature just work its way and take its toll. And um, so anyway, the, it seems to be one out of three on the, on the, on the doves le left here. Um, I was just checking up um, success rates and down in the Western Cape. I mean, you can have 20, 30, 40% of nests, never mind the actual success rate of the eggs and fledglings, but, you know, you can have 
20-30% of the nests themselves getting completely obliterated, whether it's through strong winds or complete predation, that kind of stuff. So, you know, the, the, the fact that there's one out of three remaining is actually not that bad. And they also fledge very, very quickly. So, you know, the, the, we've been watching these for not quite two weeks, but almost. And um, so this bird's are literally about to fledge. Probably in the next day or two, I reckon this bird's going to be off the nest. And then it'll hang around this area for another week and a half to two weeks. Um, and then it'll be gone. And, you know, there's another strong strong bird in the population, you know, as opposed to three kind of semi-strong ones. So although this, uh, you know, what we're seeing is very sad, it, it just does happen. I'm more and more convinced on those, on the Shelby family, that there's, it's predation going on there, that one could have been exposure, that, that one that we found, that super cold night, and the fact that it was lying there. But the fact that we've had now two consecutive nights with, with ducklings missing, that tells me that's almost certainly, and no trace of the others, that tells me that there's, that there's some predator has twigged on to these ducklings being there on the bank with the parents and that. And obviously if some predator goes for them and attacks them or sneaks up on them, um, it'll be very difficult for the parents to try to control all those little ducklings going in every which direction. So imagine seeing that at night. Oh, oh my goodness. The things that happen in the bush. In the outdoors. Oh, anyway. So we've lost like a whole pile of meerkat. Well, not we, not a whole pile. You know, we we lost two out of the five pups on the meerkats. We lost one of the adults got gobbled up, which we saw with the wildcat. The, the Shelby family is getting whittled away. The doves are down to a third of their brood. And on that happy note, oh my goodness, anyway. But this is it. This is, oh, what's, okay, okay. We've got a jackal incoming here from the right. Can you see it there, David? No. Okay, just give us a second, guys. Coming out there, there we go. See it? Yeah. Okay, we got a jackal incoming. That's just out of interest. So it's these little wily coyotes. That brings back memories, wily coyote. But it's these are the kind of guys that would be trying to take a chance on a, on that family of ducklings. Okay, he's just gone behind the bush now, but this is a black backed jackal. And even a nesting, like this little dove, you know, if they are sort of hopping around in the tree or out the nest and they end up on the ground, these little guys will go for them. But that brings me to another point while we're talking about that kind of potential for predation. There's the adult birds, these adult doves, and a number of species do it, but these adult doves actually do this like really, really cool, um, what they call a broken wing display, or it's also known as a distraction display. So if you've got um, a predator, particularly a land-based predator in the area, or kind of angling towards the nest, the adults will actually fly down onto the ground, and then they actually pretend that they've got an injured wing and they'll like kind of flop along flop along flop along on the ground and they can go for a long way like that um if the predator gets too close then they just take off um but that's actually a very very clever strategy for kind of as the name says it's a distraction display and that actually gets the predator away from the the, the really important site which is the nest so many things and we still know nothing about nature in the big picture yeah, you can sit in your back garden and I can tell you, you would come up with a hundred questions overnight in your back garden. There's a jackal crossing the road there now, but sorry, he's just straight directly behind the vehicle. We'll have a bit of a, bit of a, the antenna in the way, don't worry about it. It's not David's fault. So this little guy's on a morning patrol, but yeah, like I was saying, you, you, you'd come up with a hundred questions in your garden, your back garden, that scientists won't have the, have the answers to yet, you know, and, um, Particularly if you really want to go like species specific, um, then it becomes so. So often we have like, often we have like these kind of like general things, assumptions that we can make, or that we not can make, that we do make. We say, okay, well, um, animals cope with cold weather like this dish. But if you say to him, okay, well, how does this specific species do X, Y, Z, or why is that aphid? Those that species of aphids, why are its an antenna 
longer than the next species? Or why is it that shade of green as opposed to a different shade of green? And how does a chameleon change color as opposed to a crab spider changing color? There are, there's just, the, the list is endless and you can, you'll never, ever, ever stop learning. And I think for me, that's the single most fun thing out here is that apart from just like enjoying the outdoors and being able to explore, but is just realizing every single day how little I know about these environments. And any environment you're in, doesn't matter where you go, it's just like, it's, it's a never-ending quest for trying to figure out these, these, um, these systems and what's, what's, what's the, what are the driving factors behind them. Eh? So, you know, it, for me, it's never about the individual. It's, it's sad if a dove gets eaten. It's tragic if a leopard cub disappears. It's heartbreaking if all the, you know, if the Shelby ducklings are disappearing, particularly after the effort that you put into finding them and that. Um, but it is part of what these systems are. And, it, it, you know, that kind of predation, like I say, is... There, there are some excellent books, um, and you should actually try to get them if you're interested in reading. And that um, one particularly good one is called "Where the Wild Things Were." Where the wild things were, look it up. It is a brilliant book on the role of predators in ecosystems, and it is a exceptionally good read. And I would recommend it to absolutely anyone if you're interested in wanting to see what how important predation is in any ecosystem. Right here, we've come off to the western side of the reserve to see what we can find this side. We're on to Simbambili, and the tracks of the wild dogs were heading this way this morning, but I haven't managed to pick up any of those. Plenty of hyenas had a party around here last night, and over here, I can hear the calls of many blue wax bills. Ooh, what's that? There's a fire finch right on the shore of the water there. You see there? Down on the shore, down, down. Okay, let's just keep on the water there and I'll see if I can find anything else. It's seriously advanced camera work to try and find a small bird like that. You've what? Okay, just stand by there. It's here. Sorry, everybody. One second. There, it's off. There. Sorry about that. One or two things to fix with the camera. We're okay now. Let's go somewhere else. We'll try and sort this out. So this morning, see that's the tail of a leopard. Oh, there's another leopard. We've just arrived to the scene where it's been a game of tag. Up on the dam wall now. This watering hole has got a dam wall on its eastern side, and the trackers, Adam and Tom, have been on fire this morning. They found these two as well as their mother. Well, they actually saw, I suspect, their mother up a tree not long, not far from here, somewhere where they are. Now they've been playing this game of tag up and down this dam wall this morning. And there's no sign of any other animal nearby, so I think these two have been having quite the ball around here. Look at that white tip of the tail, sitting with her back towards us. Looking down, there's a dry riverbed on that side and it goes quite down deep. Vera, that is not mom and baby. It is the brother and sister. So, it's difficult to say for sure. 
And the one up on the damn wall that we can see at the moment looks like it might be the young female. And then the young male is hiding somewhere nearby at the moment. We can't see him, but he's also there. Now they have been going up and down, up and down that damn wall. Here we go. You can see now it's a bit of grooming going on. Looks like it's grooming its hind foot. And they've been down on the water's edge. There's a lot of wet mud still. And I saw one of them step in the mud as it was chasing the other one. Oh, it's quite a privilege to see two young leopards play like this. Even if it's brother and sister, the young male's already quite a bit larger than his sister. And his appetite is also quite a bit larger, which just means that his mother needs to hunt more and more. But it's always so fun to see them play. It actually does serve a very, very important purpose. And that purpose is as they play, they basically hone their skills, their predatory instinct. Every move in their games, you can just see as a bit of a, it will eventually become a killing blow. They usually go for the throat with soft bites the back of the neck, the way they pounce and stalk each other, it's all a way that gradually hones their skills. You can see the other one's up on the wall now as well, and it looks like it's walking over to its sister. Let's see if it is the young male, that one. Yep, that's the young male, so it was his sister. You can see they're locked there in a little bit of a, a very cat-like hug. See, trying to push the other one with the back feet off. <laughs> Rose, they, leopards do know their family members their entire lives. If they stick around the same area, I'm not 100% sure that if that young male, perhaps when he gets older, he'll be the one more than likely to move off. Often we find that the young female might start setting t up her own territory, either within her mother's territory and gradually push the mother out, or nearby her mother's territory and then gradually move in or move a little bit further away. But I have noticed in the past that even when the young male have moved off for a long period of time and return, they do seem to recognize each other. At least the mother seems to recognize her young ones as well. But it's not always a happy family, family reunion as one might suspect. At that stage, when the males grow larger, they grow more greedy and they'll come and they'll steal the food that was caught by either their sister or even their mother. And the mother and her daughter might eventually become competitors and they might even fight each other over territory if that is necessary. But I'd say they most definitely recognize each other. There is a bit of a bond, even though it is a animal that is completely solitary, as most people might think. They certainly do have a bit of um, social interaction with other animals within the area. So it looks like these two have settled down, they're not as active anymore, but as soon 
uh, something comes past, that might change. So I think myself and Owen will sit here a little while longer and see what they're up to. We're struggling a little bit, everyone, to find any fresh signs of this female cheetah and her youngsters, but we are definitely not struggling in terms of finding zebra. Look at this beautiful group that we've got here in front of us. Also all busily feeding. And there's one zebra here in particular that I really want to show you. It's currently got its head down, but as soon as it lifts its head, um, Craig will get it on camera for you. There's one zebra that looks really, really old. Shame, it looks like it's been through the walls. It looks like it's losing hair out of its face. Oh, there it is there. Have a look at that, everyone. Look at how mangy its face looks. All the hair has fallen out. Look at its mane. Its mane has lost a lot of its hair. And it's even starting to flop at the front of its neck, if you look carefully. There we go. Oh, shame, look at that. My goodness, it's almost like a, like a zombie zebra. So that zebra must be coming towards the end of its life, uh, well, towards the end of its lifespan. Looking at its belly, look at how fat its, its, its tummy looks. So it doesn't look like malnourished or anything from, from, from that point of view. But of course with zebra, some of you may know, I don't know if many of you have heard about how a zebra's digestive system works. Uh, but because of the, the fermentation that takes place, it's a, it's a high end gut fermenter, so it's not a ruminant. It doesn't chew the cud like uh, giraffes and antelopes and buffalo. But rather the, the grass that it takes in sits and ferments um, in the gut. And that causes a lot of gas, which causes the belly to bloat like that. And so even a zebra that is malnourished will still have that very fat looking tummy. And it's by looking at the mane that you can often tell a zebra's condition. And if the mane starts to flop, because that mane is held up in place by fat deposits, if the mane starts to flop, it tells you that the fat deposits are, are, are getting less and less and that the zebra is perhaps a little bit malnourished. Josie, who's nine years old, you're asking a very interesting question. You're asking how old are zebras when they get their stripes? Josie, they're born with their stripes, so they have them their entire lives. When it comes and a little baby zebra is born, it's already got its stripes. Um, and it's something that we were just chatting about now amongst ourselves, actually. When a zebra is born, like many animals, they're covered in like a very soft, fine fluff. And so often when, they, when they're born, they look almost quite scruffy and almost gray but you can still see the stripes pretty clearly and then as they get older they kind of shed that baby coat and start to grow their adult coat but look at these zebra here now that we're busy filming look at how dark brown they are compared to the ones that we saw earlier remember those ones we saw earlier were quite 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 light and quite bright almost that very stark contrast between the black and the white stripes look at these ones and how brown they are and looking through my binoculars, it looks like they've been rolling around in the sand. A lot of the sand here and the dust here is quite red in color. And often see zebra rolling around on their backs, having a good dust bath. And that's why they've taken on this, this very rich reddish brown color. See how as they feed, have a careful look at these zebra. Watch, they never have their heads down for very long. So watch the one that's now, or the ones that are now on screen. Heads down, busy grazing, but look at how every now and then they lift their head up and scan around. Just to keep an eye out for any potential danger. And that's what myself and Craig have been doing too. <clears throat> Excuse me, as we've been driving. We've been stopping on prominent hillsides and and scanning into the grass and looking for any sign of this of this mother cheetah and her youngsters and 
I'm just padding across quite a good sized a good sized group there's almost looks like there's two or three different groups that have come together and I think now as these zebra continue feeding down the hillside myself and Craig are gonna carry on we're gonna keep scanning keep searching keep looking for any fresh tracks of this female cheetah and hopefully when you come back to us we'll have found something to give us an indication of where she's gone So we're just watching a herd of buffalo move away from Ndlovu Dam here at the eco-training camp. They've just finished having a drink. Now they're heading back out to continue feeding. Big animals like this need to feed all the time. Maybe they're just inspecting the damage that all the elephants did last night. Oh, the elephants did quite a number on our camp. They were in there the whole time. In fact, it was old Kumo, our friend. So these buffaloes also seem to be visiting the camp quite frequently. There's a whole bunch of them. From some fairly young ones to some big old bulls. They're actually following a giraffe right now. It looks very interesting. It's almost like they're uh, following the leader. The tall giraffe there is just telling them where to go. And they are slowly following on behind. Those few first few buffaloes are quite often the biggest, strongest males. And they often call them pathfinders. The ones who, who make the decisions about which direction to travel and also check for danger and then quite often trailing the herd you'll find another couple of big bulls which act as the rear guard protecting the end of the buffalo herd any weak individuals from potential attack from lions there was a pride of about six lionesses and a male seen on our very eastern borders uh, yesterday evening so they might be the kind of pride that might take on a buffalo certainly enough lions to to do the job. These buffaloes don't seem like they've gone very far before they seem to be stopping there to start feeding, which is great. It'll be nice to have them close to the camp for the day. It's always a pleasure to have such big animals spending time with us. It's going to be a hot day today, I think, so I'll probably come down again and drink a little bit later as well. Maybe even have a bit of a mud wallow or a swim. First thing this morning when Seb and I left the camp, there were three big old buffalo bulls that were crossing the dam and they went, you know, up to their bellies in the water and I thought that's crazy because it was super cold this morning. But big animals like this don't feel the cold with their tough skin the same way that we do. You can see that, that buffalo there's got massive horns, very widespread horns. You can see them sticking out either side of its body. often doing some fighting every now and again these old buffalo bulls they're not very old these ones these few that are walking past these are you know, fairly young bulls maybe just coming into their prime now so they'll be doing a lot of fighting over the rights to the females see that buffalo there the, the boss is big and strong but it hasn't got that smooth shininess yet so there's still a bit of time to go before that buffalo becomes one of the biggest dominant males. See that at the back, all the big strong males at the back there and then also a few strong males at the front. It's amazing how they work as a team to defend themselves. And buffalo, of course, some of the only ones that will actively defend themselves against lions. Turning back and chasing after ones that have been caught by lions and freeing them. It's amazing to watch. I don't know if anyone has ever seen Battle in the Kruger there's a video that went viral some some years ago. It was incredible. Buffaloes, a calf being caught by lions, and then the buffaloes coming back and chasing the lions off, and the calf falls into water, and then all of a sudden there's a tug of war between crocodiles and lions. The calf's in the middle. It was a crazy cool video, and it always just amazes me how tough buffaloes can be. After all that, that calf got up and walked away to rejoin the herd. So amazing to see the resilience of these creatures. Now one final look back at the water before the herd slowly moves on. Just onto the northern side of this little drainage line that feeds Ndlovu Dam. See, that's a female, much thinner horns. 
It's not easy to identify them when they're super young, but once they get big like this, you can see a female quite clearly. Well, we're probably going to head round now and try and see if we can relocate them on the other side of this drainage line. Right, we've got a nice little group of dwarf mongusta that are enjoying the sun, as they should be, on a chilly morning like today, especially when it really hasn't heated up like we hoped that it might. A big troop, I think. It's quite a big mound. There's a bit of grooming going on. And a bit of a breeze just slowly starting to come up as the morning moves towards its middle portion. You might also just be able to hear the cattle bells Dixie Village. It's so funny, all of these little mongoose, if you watch them, they yawn. And I think they're very much like us, yawn in sympathy with each other. They are so cute. I think if it wasn't for the fact that they were so small and vulnerable, I wouldn't mind being a mongoose if I was an animal. We're always getting asked, what animal would you be? I think it looks like quite a nice life, the life of a dwarf mongoose, but for the fact, of course, that you are so tiny and so vulnerable. But the actual lifestyle looks quite good, I think late mornings, early evenings, watching the sunrise and sunset every day. Live music every night. They don't really have live music every night. I think I also heard a purple crested lurry through there, which I don't think we've ever got on camera because they don't generally occur here as it's not normally wet enough. We don't have enough trees. Well, enough big trees. Well, that's why I keep going silent for lengthy periods. I'm hoping to hear it again. Mongoose are doing. Neva, I've never seen a, an albino mongoose, but I presume it is possible. I'm not sure that an albino mongoose would survive very long. You probably do get leucistic mongoose from time to time. I've seen or heard of, I can't remember which, a leucistic banded mongoose but not a, not a dwarf one. But that's not to say they don't occur. You can 
definitely hear the cattle bells now. something quite comforting about the bells on cattle. All free-ranging cattle, of course. No feedlots for them or pens or anything else. They spend their days grazing the land. Sometimes to the detriment of the land, but that's what they're doing. Good. Well, I think let's continue from this wolf mongoose site. Carry on. So we're in the middle parts of Simbambili now, still hoping maybe to pick up on some wild dog tracks. The pack would have settled by now, but where they've settled is anyone's guess. Found another spot. These two have been playing up and down dam wall and eventually went down the back of it rolling in a rolling fashion, one tackling the other one down. And now they seem to settle down. The one we're looking at at the moment is a female. She's going to settle in the shade in classical leopard fashion of course she's blending in perfectly so the direction that she's looking she's looking at her brother so even though the energy has gone down a little bit still every now and again one of them might run over to the other one and try and play with it Now I'm pretty sure that these two will spend most of the day in this area where they're lying as the entrance into a dry riverbed. And the young male is over there. He was somewhere over there. And maybe he's already stalking his sister. But the, so the mother was here earlier, we haven't really got a view of her, and I think she's left these two, and she's probably off to go and see if she can hunt something, or maybe even patrol territory. At this age, with these two being as large as they are, she spends almost more, most of her time looking for something to hunt. Not just to feed herself, but also to feed these two. And when it's like this, especially at this age, we often see that the two young ones will stay within the same area until the mother comes back. Now she might just make a way past this area, maybe later on today or during the night and then maybe tomorrow. And they might stay in and around this area. They won't always necessarily be close to each other. Like a young male might move off a little bit further, spend some time on his own. And the female do the same. The older they get, the more and more time they spend on their own. So the older they get, moments like this gets rarer and rarer. I know about a week ago we saw the young male with a 
they be dwarf mongoose that it caught. So they're also experimenting with different prey items. They're also trying to practice their own hunting skills. And where they are at the moment, you can spend quite a bit of time here without any of the other animals that come past knowing that they are actually here. You can see she's looking over, she's wondering where did the brother go. I think even she is wondering where he went. So it looks like she's moving towards him. I think maybe what myself and Owen might do is try and get down there and see if we might get a better view. So the meerkats! I know we've we we haven't we didn't forget about them or anything. It's just with this really cooler and as you would have seen windy weather that we've been having the past couple of days. Um, we, I just thought it was a little bit more prudent to focus on a couple of other things. Um, one of them being <laughs> the goshawk nest, which we still haven't found. So I just need to like put a little bit more effort in there um, for you. Um, but we will we'll get that goshawk nest. And whatever the time is now, I don't know, I haven't even checked, it's probably 8 or somewhere around there. Um, so these meerkats are actually popping out a little bit later because of this cool weather. And this little guy has only been out for about 3 or 4 minutes now. So the others will follow fairly soon, I think. And um, still the 5 adults, remember after the one was schnaffled by the wildcat, and then the 3 pups. There's jackal, a jackal that's spotted past over here. A lot of wind, you know, there's been a lot of wind in the area, so the, the most of the tracks are obliterated. <laughs> Helen says, meerkats, hooray! I agree. In fact, you're going to laugh because I said to you when we were at the shell, I said, no, we're going to go do the meerkats today. And when we got up, to the close to the burrows over here. Um, so David and I had a lovely African wildcat sighting two days. Oh, was it yesterday? Day before? Yesterday? Yesterday morning. We had a lovely wildcat sighting. It was so fast though, so we weren't live unfortunately. It just like zooted out from a bush, disappeared. These things have. And we were chatting about it now after saying, Are we going to come to the meerkats? When we got up, I was like, David and I were like, Yes, I wonder if we should go try and find this wildcat. And we started driving down the road, and then I just couldn't do it. I was like, no, no, come. Let's, let's just do the meerkats. We've said we'll do it. And, uh, you know, we haven't, haven't been with them a couple of days, so I just thought it would be really the right thing to do. But it just, yeah, coming back to that whole predation thing, it just, you know, it's just brought into stark reality just what all of these things out here go through on a daily basis. It's not a, you know, and David was actually laughing. He was saying as well, he was saying, yeah, he wasn't laughing at things getting killed, but he was, what he was, he was saying, you know, it's like every time you have a, a situation like this, you know, you've got a, a, some little ones being born, whether it's cubs or birds or whatever it is, and you like, well, maybe this time it'll be different. You know, maybe this time, you know, they all go, it's like, what possesses us to think like that? Because it's, you know, the nature, things just get, you know, these little black-chested prinias flitting around you. What have you got there, David? A bird. No, no. Oh. <laughs> so, so, you got a little black-chested prinia that's just coming past me now. They're foraging out. They're going to be nesting as well. There's so many things that are starting to nest now. But tracking down the actual nest is a completely different story. So, But we'll keep our eyes open. Um, and I'm wondering if we passed the last cold snap for the season yet. Mm, I don't think so. I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna be having another proper, proper cold snap in the next couple of next week or so. That's my gut feel. Maybe even sooner, but we'll see.
Wild Earth relies on support from viewers like you to carry on broadcasting our daily live shows. A small donation goes a long way in helping us on our mission to connect the world with nature. Please visit our support page to see how you can help and become part of the Wild Earth family. Guess who's here, everyone? We've been sitting here watching an adorable moment between Corky and her little one. You may not be able to see it perfectly, but I can assure you it's there. Theo's gonna zoom in. <laughs> there we go, there's a bum. Now, unfortunately, well, actually, I need to tell you what's happened today. So we sat, for those of you that are aware, this is den number three. And we call it den number three because there's actually three dens in a row. Den one, den two, den three. And we actually found Corky this morning with her little one suckling inside the entrance of den number two. Now, some of you will know that very well. It's actually the den that Ribbon started. It was her natal den this time round. And Corky was in that exact same position in the entrance suckling her young. How incredible is that? Now, we had to leave because it was another vehicle. But it was pretty astonishing to see because then what she proceeded to do was get up and move to this den. So is Corky also using den number two? I don't know. But it was amazing. She was in the exact same position that Ribbon was months ago, just spending some alone time with her young. And she's obviously brought this youngster back to den number three now. And they're enjoying lying in the sun, warming up after a cold night and getting some vitamin D. Isn't that lovely? So it just surprises me that Corky was at den number two, but luckily for us, the sort of two track to get into this den passes den numbers two. So I do always check on a daily basis. It was just amazing to see her there this morning. I just wonder if they are utilizing the two dens. That's what happened last year when Corky was actually matriarch. When the cups started to get older, they bounced around a little bit more. So they stayed in the same area, but probably for hygiene and practicality, if you like, they bounced around between the two dens. Although Ribbon's boys are very tender, there's quite a substantial size difference between this tiny little black ball of fur compared to Ribbon's boys. Ah, an amazing story for this morning, and it's so lovely to see her. I haven't seen any sign of the other two, but I am more than sure they're sleeping. They like long lies. They don't like to wake up early. Unless Mummy Ribbon tells them to come out. Unfortunately, we can't actually get a better angle. But I'm sure once this one's tummy is full of milk, get a much better view. I find it very peaceful at the den. But if another vehicle arrives, it's still a one vehicle sighting, so we will have to leave. But hopefully, hopefully not. <laughs> but of course, if anyone wants to see this precious moment, then we'll have to pull out. Now, with a car that small, the tummy's going to be really, really small. So they really won't be able to drink much at a time. And once that tummy gets full, they'll obviously stop drinking, try to cuddle mum as long as possible. And that's why Corky will have to visit the den far more often than Ribbon will these days. Lodeca, can I just check you're still there? We've had a lot of problems with our radios this morning. Ruth, that's a great question. Hyenas do not allosuckle. So there's no allosuckling involved like lionesses. So if ribbon, this is, this is really, really interesting and I'd love to see what happens because although they don't allosuckle, 
and Ribbon will never suckle Corky's little one, we may actually see Corky allow Ribbon's two boys to suckle from her. I hope that all makes sense. Why is that? Well, normally, if you're the lowest ranking individual, if you're at the bottom of the hierarchy, as Corky is now, sometimes they're almost bullied into allowing it to happen. So with Plonk, when Corky's previous son, who sadly is no longer with us, he was very boisterous and he knew his status as a high ranker and he was very dominant in his behaviour. We saw him bullying the other cubs, we saw him bullying adults and he sometimes forced his way into drinking milk from Ribbon or at least tried to. I don't know if it was ever successful because at that time Ribbon was the lowest ranker. Now remember there's been a switch. They've completely switched ends, ribbons at the top, Corky's at the bottom. So she may allow it because she's a low ranker and she has to be submissive and just sort of let things wash over her. But technically speak speaking, aloe suckling doesn't happen. There's definitely records of low ranking hyenas allowing it in order to please the high ranking hyena. But that's sort of more based on the clan dynamics than it is hyena biology. They only have two nipples because normally they have twin litters and if Ribbon's boys really wanted to march right out of the den and try to suckle from Corky she may just allow it. She also may not but I really don't think they would do that actually. I'm speculating but Ribbon's boys are, are very gentle in their approach to not only Corky but Corky's little one. So unless another vehicle arrives, my morning is set and I'm not planning on going anywhere. So there's a little bit of more activity going on here. Three other adults have popped out. We're just waiting for another two. And then the pup, I think the pups will follow very, very shortly behind them as well. Aye, okay, so there's number four that's out. And one of the pups, two of the pups. They're just below the, the, the ridge of sand in front of where the camera is there, but you'll see them shortly. Hey, we got them. Yes, and they are growing like a Boeing. Just another day or two and they're going to be adults. <laughs> then it's varsity and then they leave home. Okay, so now we're just waiting for one pup. It's all of the adults are out now. I almost thought I heard a Something like a meerkat down to my right over here. It's really just my hearing. So, it's so nice they've followed the fortunes of these meerkats over the past couple of weeks, so sure. It's amazing how time flies when you when you invest yourself in something like this. Well, this is perfect weather for them. Rebecca was saying the other day they only came out the burrow. They only started popping out at half past nine. And that was due to that incredibly cold snap that we had. I mean, David and I were out in that and it was just blowing like a banshee out here. Um, and freezing, freezing cold. And that kind of weather they don't do. But this is mild today, so I think they'll, they'll actually be out foraging fairly soon, I reckon. <laughs> Megan says she's melting into a puddle. <laughs> uh, no, they are sweet little things. Eh? And it, it just, it, it, I just always find it incredible how, and it, and it, and it's totally understandable 
in terms of the size of these animals, how we often think they, or people often think they're a lot larger than they are. And most of your footage, obviously if you're doing wildlife photography or, or videography, that kind of thing, you really want to be at the height of your subject. That gives it the, the, the best perspective. You know, if you're looking at it from the animal's perspective. However, what that does, also it creates this impression that, that things are a lot larger than they are, especially if you're dealing with small mammals or insects, you know, those kind of things. And um, so many of the, 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 so much of the work that's been done on meerkats in terms of filming has been done super close to them and right at their eye level. And, um, you know, so many people think, yeah, these meerkats kind of like stand knee high. Um, yeah, I've even had guests thinking they're waist high animals. Um, but they, they're small, they're tiny little things. Eh? But it is really com interesting to compare them to things like dwarf mongoose that our colleagues are seeing in the other areas. And a dwarf mongoose is like a third of the size, at best, of one of these little guys. In fact, dwarf mongoose are like these, these pup sizes. You know, uh, you, yeah, maybe yeah, not even these pup sizes. Someone should habituate those dwarf mongoose like this. I reckon. So yeah, so while we were off just now, I just did a nice sweep of the burrows here and, a, and a, it's a single set of jackal tracks coming past from last night. So there's been no other sign. In fact, I haven't seen any sign of honey badgers for a while now. Um, but those honey badgers cover immense areas. Someone asked me um, a comparison on leopards. The other day, and I'm just giving you an example here. Again, it's a vastly different environment to where we are even. Um, you've got no permanent bodies of water, very low game density, um, at least for much of the year. A male leopard territory size can vary between 1,700 and 2,000 square kilometers for one animal. And your female territories can be seven, 800, or between four and 800 square kilometers. Those are immense areas, and honey badgers in these kind of environments probably not that large because they, you know, they they they'll go for a whole range of different prey species as well, and even very very small stuff. But nonetheless, you know, these environments are markedly different to where our colleagues are working, um, and your territory sizes, even of the same species, are correspondingly that much larger. And it is one of the features of 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 guiding in these areas, you, you, you know, you, you can't, you know, drive around and just, you, you'll bump stuff, but you've, you've actually just got to put in a couple of man hours if you really want to get some good sighting. So, and that's why coming back to like the goshawks and things, you know, you, you've just got to focus and dedicate a lot of time to locating nests like that, but we'll do it. We'll do it. Or it's either that that I do or I study nuclear physics in my spare time. So, you know, it's like toss up between looking for the goshawk nest or nuclear physics. But, um, yeah, I'll see. <laughs> Not. So Theo has just asked, do meerkats have identifiable markings? to be able to tell the difference between them? Absolutely, they are, they can be notoriously difficult to tell apart. Um, there is actually one over here that's actually got a scar on its face, it's actually got a patch of skin off on its face, an old injury, that one's identifiable, the matriarch's identifiable. It's very easy in small groups like this because you can like, kind of get a feel for it. Okay, there's a male, there's a female, that's an alpha female, that's a subadult female, that's one of the scar, you know, pretty straightforward. Where it becomes incredibly tricky is with larger groups. And there are groups in the area, not on Swali, but another area close by to us. Um, they actually have ta they've taken up residence on this fossil riverbed, um, a river called the, the, the Kamakara Kuruman River. Um, these things only flow if you get exceptionally heavy rains, and it's like once every 10, 15, 20 years there's a bit of water in them. But anyway, so the habitat there is quite different, massive trees. Um, but there you're getting groups of 30, 40 meerkats at a time. Now to identify individuals within groups like that can be incredibly difficult, but there are ways of doing it. We can chat about that as well.
So we've managed to catch up with that buffalo herd and they are slowly on the move up this hillside. As you can see, quite spread out amongst these grassy thickets. There's a female being attended by an oxpecker. Oh, it should be nice and clean. So these buffalo are not moving fast, but if they keep going, they'll end up going towards Leopard Dam. They keep doing that. They kind of ping pong and bounce between the two dams. You know, being ruminants, they need to drink a lot of water in order to keep their digestive system, digestive system operating perfectly. You can see they just spread out in a line, feeding as they walk slowly up this crest. It's quite amazing. They're like lawnmowers. You'll see behind this herd all the grass will be much shorter than in front. They are literally mowing the lawn for us here at Pride Lands. It's not a very huge herd, but it's a decent size. And there's a few youngsters as well, so that's good. It means this herd is breeding and successful. And no lions are following them. Not yet, anyway. That's always a good thing for buffaloes. You can just see their horns glinting the sunlight just coming off to our left. Quite noisy actually. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it but I can hear cracking branches and the munching of their their mouths on the grass. Far louder than elephants to be honest. A herd of ten elephants makes a lot less noise when they're just walking in the bush. Tabby, you're right. They are mowing. Or oh, the female did not like whatever just happened. She had a patch of grass that she was mowing and another buffalo came too close and she just made sure that they all knew that they didn't like that. A grumpy looking female. Sometimes if they've got calves, a calf will, will, you know, or an adult will come too close to the calf and bother it and the mothers are quite protective and they'll rush over and chase them. They've got this, this, um, how can I say, reputation is a good word, for being very, very aggressive. And I'm not sure that's the case. I mean, buffalo are not aggressive by nature, but they are very big and they are very strong. And so they will use their size to their advantage and push other animals around and chase other animals. I mean, as you can see now, most for the most part, they're all fairly docile. They're just eating and moving along. There's a big bull there with a massive boss. My goodness. Look at the size of that thing. That's really like a shield on top of its head. Anushka, that's a great question. Uh, I'm assuming that buffaloes, like many mammals, just have the two sets of teeth. I don't, I don't know if they do have milk teeth uh, and then just have their main set that, that comes out, but they're not like elephants that have many different sets of fused teeth that slowly emerge over their life. But certainly once they've got their permanent teeth, then those will be there for good. And like we get milk teeth when we're babies and they fall out and we get our permanent teeth. I'm not sure if buffaloes get the same, but they certainly won't be like elephants having multiple sets of teeth. It'll just be the one set of teeth as far as I'm aware. That's good because it helps us to age them. When we find a skull of a, of a buffalo, if you know what you're doing, you can look at the teeth and you can get a really good estimate of how old a buffalo was by, you know, how worn down the teeth are. If they've got new sets of teeth all the time, it might be quite tricky to tell that. They seem to be more or less on the move now. Just coming out onto the road is one of those big, strong buffalo bulls who's probably one of the pathfinders. And as he makes his way, just like this one on the screen now, as they make their way forward, the rest of the herd will follow behind. All the youngsters and the females, the smaller females, are behind this wall of muscle and horn. Not much is going to get through this. Critter Freak, this is a big bull. I mean, the size of the boss was really impressive. Not so much the spread of the horns, but just the width and the, the depth of the boss was really, really impressive. This might be the one with the biggest horns of all the buffaloes that I've seen in this particular group. Very strong, look at that, see how broad that is. And you can see now that it turns towards us how thick and strong that neck is. The head is weighing a huge amount. Uh, I mean, I can't estimate how many kilograms that weighs, but 
You know, that'll be probably more than 20 kilograms, just its head, including the horns. So it'll need very, very strong. Imagine doing a 20 kilogram curl on a, on a weight or something, like all day, every day. Amazing. Now, what we've got here is quite interesting because it's what we've been talking about for the last two days. Here's a young elephant, and as you can see, he's devouring marula bark. And you can see he's having to work very hard to get any little pieces. Quite cool, really. I actually haven't seen him take even a small piece off yet. <laughs> there he got a little bit. Surely that must hurt his teeth. Got a good sized piece there. Nice boy. Don't drop that on the ground. Make sure you eat it all, as you're doing some nasty damage to this tree. Yes, Anna Marie, there most definitely is nutrition in the bark. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother with it. Well, I mean, either that or it would just taste nice. But I think there is definitely some nutrition. It comes from the vascular tissue mainly. What do you say, fellow? Hmm? I've tasted it and it's pretty bitter. Not like the acacia bark, which is quite nice actually. The chilia or Senegalia bark, I mean, not acacia anymore, alas. Who's awake? <laughs> now, another vehicle was here earlier and, oh, it's so cute. And they actually sent me a message and the reason I'm telling you this because the comment was, I think there's another mother with a different cub. They didn't actually realize that this was Corky and Corky's cub. And why they didn't realize that was that this cub is particularly small. And it is, they were right. Actually, it's very small. And I've mentioned this before, but Corky's cub will never be as big and as strong and as sort of healthy looking at, as Ribbon's cubs at the same age. And, <laughs> and that's just how it works in hyenas, everyone. Corky is just now at the bottom. And she'll survive, she'll thrive in her own way, but it's a different lifestyle, being a high ranker to being a low ranker. Um, excuse me, where are you going? Stop being so brave. But it is definitely getting bigger. Marginally so, but it's bigger. The eyes are wide open now. The, the mobility's better. 
This little cup's still got a bit of a wobbly movement, but it's moving a lot better than before. It's definitely getting bigger and stronger, but it just will never be the same as Ribbon's Cubs at the same age. And that's why lots of people keep mistaking it for a new cub. I've heard this quite a few times and I completely understand why, because it's so small. <laughs> and it just wants more and more nutrition, clearly. Shamesy, good to hear from you. You're saying so precious, I know. I'm so glad, because the hyena den wasn't active earlier. I mean, yes, it's been a morning of trying to find the hyenas. And we got lucky. It's still a sensitive sighting because the little one is, is young. But it's so precious. I just wonder what happened. Did this little one have a twin? Did Corky give birth to two? To two cubs? <laughs> Did she lose one? We, we really have no way of knowing. She also only had Plonk in her previous litter as a single cub. I wonder why she's not recently given birth to twin litters. Melissa, we all want to know. Nobody knows. And personally, I feel it's far too young to... Oh, oh, come back. Look at Corky even looking. It's too young to tell. But if we get a, a good moment, I've already asked Theo to zoom into the genitals. But I feel it's far too young to actually really see if it's male or female. Yeah, it's a very, very small penis stroke pseudo penis. Oh, we found a new hole and we're disappearing into a completely new hole. I didn't know the hyenas were using that. But yes, Melissa, we will try and sex this little one as soon as we can. So I'm going to continue sitting here watching the antics of Corky and her little one. How awesome are these meerkats now? Hey, these little pups are just like, they've like really warmed up and now they're starting to move around. What I always find fascinating is just how they often come out in a group and then as the, as the temperature kind of rises, they start splitting up. And that's exactly what the adults have done there now. You know, they've kind of like moved, moved to the side a little bit. You know, they've each got their little separate burrow over there and, um, you know, I don't know what that's about, you know, if it's just kind of making sure that all the burrows are fine and there's nothing dodgy going on in any other burrows there. Because um, the other side of it now, you know, we've, we've gone through the problems that we've had with African wildcats and honey badgers and the potential risk of goshawks, um, those kind of things. But as temperatures start climbing, the other thing that's going to become more and more of a challenge for these little guys down these burrows are things like snakes monitor lizards a cape cobra will go in and will gobble up a pup in about three seconds without even batting an eyelid a cape cobra if it can fit something in its mouth it'll eat it and you know an average size cobra arch will be 1.1 1 1.2 meters long easily easily capable of eating a pup this size i think we're still before everyone panics it's like i think we're still a good couple of weeks away from that um you know and by then these pups are going to be way way more wily than they are now um so i don't think there's a huge huge risk there but it is a reality but then things like monitor lizards you know and um we've got these rock monitors here david and i actually saw one um the other day it was uh, probably 20 minutes after the drive had finished but on the way back i mean the, the temperature had picked up and there was a massive rock monitor that had just come out of a hole in a camel thorn tree and it flattened himself against the bark um to try to get more heat but they will often, do, not just shelter in amongst rocks and in trees and stuff, but they'll often go down these burrows, um, you know, to, uh, through the winter. And as they start warming up, <clears throat> so they'll become more and more active, and they would prey on, on, on meerkat pups as well. And because 
Okay, this group will pro probably be fine by then, but because their breeding is aseasonal, you know, meerkats can breed actually any time they are, depending on food availability, um, as can most predators. Um, you, you know, even though these pups will be big, yeah, in a couple of weeks' time, these, this female could be pregnant again and have another litter. And it's, so I'm not so worried about these ones getting schnaffled by a monitor as an example. But it'll be any successive ones after that. But yeah, we'll just keep following the group and just see see what life holds in store for them. Yeah, but these little ones are adorable. I mean, look at that. Look at that. Veronica has asked a, a nice question there. Why are most of them in one hole? So Veronica, that is not necessarily the case. This morning we did see that, 100% right. They all came out of that one burrow, except barring one. There was, in fact, the alpha came out first out of a different hole, but the rest were all down one burrow. So you find that very, very frequently. Um, they are very social animals. They got very strongly knit ties uh, to one another. And especially in colder weather, they're more likely to be sleeping down one hole, and that's why you'd see them pop out, you know, in, in a group like that. That being said, you know, a lot of these burrows are linked underground, others aren't. And they can actually go sleep down any one of these burrows. Just, you do get it sometimes where they'll pop out, one is over there, two pop out there, three pop out that one. You know, so it is quite variable, and I have not figured that one out yet. You know, I, I have got no way of predicting, unless you actually physically watch the animals go down one hole, the problem there as well is that because some some of these, but not all of these burrows are linked underground, they could all disappear down one burrow in the evening, um, but they could still pop, pop out a different one. So what goes on underground stays underground. Yeah. <laughs> Man, they are cute, those little ones. And if you think back a couple of weeks, and they were already two weeks, uh, two months old when they popped out, it was like just shy of eight weeks, I think, when, they, when we saw them for the first time, just how uncoordinated they were. And, um, and compare them to now, where they're just like these little, like, live wires. Alas, myself and Craig have searched high and low through the grasslands, but not even a single sign of a cheetah. So we've started to move out of the plains and back into the mountains, and we've come across this beautiful weeping bourbine that's busy starting to flower. Look at all those lovely magenta red um, flowers up on that tree, and there is an amazing array of bird life that's been flying around these flowers busy feeding, and it's, it's actually quite difficult to to film because there's so many of them, so many birds, and they're moving around so much. So we're just gonna keep the camera still for now, and we're gonna see, just every now and then catch glimpses of birds flitting around. We've seen three different kinds of sunbirds all feeding on these, on these flowers. The white-bellied sunbird, the scarlet-chested sunbird, and then a bird that may be new for, for many of you, a purple-banded sunbird, the bird that we get here in the coastal regions of South Africa. Oh, there's one there on the top left, Craig. Top left of the bush. There's a male purple banner sunbird. It's just perched there. Come left a bit, I think. Oh, it's just moved. There we go. Those two that were chasing each other around. I know they are quite far away, so I'm just going to show you in the bird book what they look like so that you can see, get an idea of how they look. Exceptionally attractive, or as all male sunbirds are. So there is the, the purple banded sunbird. And in fact, look, even in this picture it's feeding on a weeping bourbine flower. So there's that lovely green back, 
and the purple band across the chest that it gets its name from with a very black tummy um, and quite a short bill and then next to it the female by contrast look at how dull she is very gray on the back and then white underneath with, with lots of streaks um, here's a, a photograph of, of the male look at how beautiful that is that lovely iridescent green and then the purple and the pink on the chest and I just want to show you some of the other sunbirds also that have been hopping around the tree just while we've been here so there's that scarlet chested sunbird beautiful red chest with the green on the throat and, the, and, and on the crown and in the black body beautiful there's also been um, spectacled weavers and yellow-throated petronias lots of different birds coming to feed on the sweet nectar of this of the sweeping burr bean so a super special little sight myself and Craig are gonna keep on heading up into the mountains to see what else we can find for you this morning We've got a herd of elephants here, thankfully. The rest of, uh, not the rest of, the herd belonging to that young bull was just up ahead. And they're very peaceably feeding. I think they're probably slowing down for the morning. They might go and find some water to drink, but they'll probably slow down and let the little ones have a rest. move a little bit forward so the young bull disappears I'm just gonna ooze forward and we'll look at him from behind the bush that he's decided to find some shaded grass beneath. That's great. And tickle with these young bulls, he gave us a bit of a look when we came in and tried to intimidate us with his vastness and then gave up and just decided that he'd rather eat something in the shade. This is not the same one that was abusing that poor Maruda tree. <clears throat> this is his friend, part of the same cohort. tell you that the wild dogs were found, just not on Simbambili. They're on Arethusa, which is the reserve south of Simbambili, where we can't go. Only about mm, 150 meters south of the boundary, so they were very close. is off everyone I'm afraid which oh look he's coming it's coming time to running leaping <laughs> it's time for you to go back in the den little one your mama's off oh, separation anxiety okay last views of the little one Theo I think it's gonna run inside and then we have to leave I'm afraid Please go back inside, little one. I don't want to turn, I'd rather turn on the engine once it's inside. That's it.
There we go, safely inside, which means we have to leave everyone, but what a lovely morning sighting. So, we have left the animals at the other watering hole, the two young leopards. They've moved into quite a dense area and we weren't able to follow them. And we made our way back to come and see if anything changed with this family of lions. The only thing that's changed is we've managed to notice these two little ones. You can see the ears moving a little bit. Every now and again you can see the brows moving. It looks like that little one is just suckling on the mother's teeth. And it's probably half asleep as it does so. other one's right next to it. And look at that. Well, these little two is probably no safer place to be in the world. Surrounded by a very large pride of lions with the two fathers nearby. And I think that's why all of these lions, there's a father, why all of these lines are so relaxed at the moment. From what I can see from the bellies, they're also probably gonna digest quite a bit today. Christelle, how do lions start a new pride when they leave? Well, it depends. It's a little bit different for male and female. And it also depends on the situation, I think. Um, the area, like the amount of other lions within that particular area. For instance, if it's a male, a young male and his brothers, once they leave the pride and they move off, they'll move into areas where there are no other males or once they have enough confidence and they're old enough and strong enough, they might try and push out the territorial males within an area that they might have found a liking to. Now that usually entails them moving far away from the original area where they have been born. And they get pushed by other large males and sometimes they literally have to flee certain areas just to stay alive and then eventually come across other prides. For females, it's a little bit different. They usually stay within their pride that they've been born into unless something happens and they move off. And in that case, they might join up with other males. If they're really lucky, they might get accepted in another pride. It has been recorded, but it's not the norm. So this little group is about to start moving. It's literally on the edge of moving off. And um, so that, that actually started moving just away from that burrow that they're sitting at there. And something spooked them and they all came running, <laughs> running straight back to it. So I don't know what was going on there. But, um, you know, they, they're obviously seeing something that we didn't see or we missed. Um, but again, you know, we've gone through this uh, a couple of times before there. Probably one of their most risky moves at any point during the day is moving away from a burrow system. You know, when they've been out foraging, you know, they, they, they're moving slowly through an area, they're digging, they've always got their sentries out, they're looking for danger, and then as a group, they, they, they're kind of filtering through the landscape and very, very vigilant. When they're coming out their burrows like this, before they move away, anything could have been creeping up on these burrows
So we can see that there's a gentle movement of these lines, bellies moving up and down, like very, very shallow breathing. Now, doesn't earlier on I saw some of them have some full bellies, especially some of the younger ones, but it doesn't look like all of them have very large bulging bellies, especially that young female. Now I wonder, whatever they ate, she might have, there's a chance she might have missed it when she went to go fetch these two little cubs. It's amazing how she can just sleep and let them drink. And I've seen that sometimes a little one like this might have its mouth on the teeth and fall asleep like that and stay like that for even a couple of hours if it has to if the mother doesn't move or roll around and if she does first thing it does is just get back into that position at this stage it's still developing it's so small so it needs to drink a lot it's also not capable of always keeping up with the pride and the large distances that they move so it's not always able to get a bit of every meal that the rest of the pride has the mother though she definitely needs food in order to be able to have enough milk for these little ones and that's why sometimes she needs to leave them on their own She looks pretty fast asleep at the moment. Just a twitch of the ear every now and again. Possibly because of the grass moving in a gentle breeze. Even the male is fast asleep at this point. This giraffe is mercifully awake, unlike the lions, and is enjoying a few new shoots. They look like new shoots. I'm sure that they're new. I just don't think that this particular black monkey thorn lost its leaves. Oof. It never fails to give me that horrible kind of... Uh, what do you call it? In, in Afrikaans they call it the khrils, where you get a kind of shiver in various parts of your body when you see something like a giraffe wrapping its tongue around thorns or when you hear the scraping of nails on a blackboard or when you are sitting in a tree or on a roof and you nearly fall off that kind of clenching in the kegel region and that's how I feel when I see this poor giraffe wrapping its tongue around the most vicious thorns that there are out here and then daintily pulling off the leaves. I mean, we've talked about this ad nauseum, but those thorns would shred your hands. I've seen monkeys climbing those trees too, though, and I don't know how it is that they don't damage their hands while they do it. Maybe they're just so calloused. Well, he's had enough of us. 
clearly. He's moved on to his next Senegalia Berkei. Bush, let me just move slightly forward. to sort of draw our part of the drive to a close, I think. So, you can see some of these lions have now put their legs up in the air, opened them up. Maybe they're trying to get a little bit of that cool air from this gentle breeze to cool down the bellies and hopefully that will cool them down you see that one's got its paw stretched out over a branch so it looks like they've settled in and I'm pretty sure they're gonna be spending their day here look at that one nice breeze flowing through it's probably also a little bit more comfortable with a full belly but I think only movements from here on forth might be to move out of the sun. Now, yesterday the scene was set at the watering hole. Today, things might be a little bit different for these lions. And with those little ones nearby, I'm pretty sure they're going to take the careful approach as well. They probably won't move too quick. And they'll more than likely be aware of the fact that they have these little ones with them. It's a pretty good area where they are. And... Um, by the evening when it cools down... We might have some general game animals moving through this area. Well, hopefully we'll have some general game animals moving through this area, which might add a little bit of excitement to the scene. Now, it's interesting what I've noted over, noticed over the last couple of months is these lines all bundle together, the male that's laying with them he always used to be the one that was a little bit further off in the distance whenever we found them all together he was usually not at the center of the pride and over the last few months we've noticed that he has been laying closer to them a little bit more regularly and funnily enough the other one has been the one that's been laying off a little bit further, as is the case at the moment. Shinara, they do they would sleep in the same strange position as your cat does. They, well, the fact that they're also cats, it's easier for them to lay on their side or on their back, like we're seeing at the moment. Um, 
there to lay flat down. You often see that they roll around a little bit. This way they can extend all their limbs and they can relax completely. Now the breeze, you can feel it a little bit more, blowing a little bit more steadily. Look how dirty that one's belly is. I'm sure that's from a mixture of blood and mud, for whatever it ate, as it was laying on its belly feeding. No. Even though some of them are quite dirty from the meal, I don't think the rest of them mind too much. I'd like to thank all our viewers for an epic morning and we hope to have you join us on the live safaris this afternoon and then we'll see what happens.